The jungle. The wilderness. It can be a dangerous place. There are giant reptiles with massive teeth. There are bugs with stingers so large they can take your eye out. There are a wild assortment of characters who can rip you to shreds. So who would want to set a video game in the middle of the jungle? Well, people who are obviously bananas, like the good folks at Nintendo. And we're about to dive in to the stellar soundtrack of the Super Nintendo classic, Donkey Kong Country. So, welcome. Welcome to the jungle. And no, this isn't Guns N' Roses. This isn't Guns N' Roses. This is OSTs and Heartbreak, an audio quest. Now, when it comes to video games, music has this transformative ability. It could completely manage a player's mood and expectations, something that I've mentioned previously on the show. Music, through harmonies, can help to tell a story by lining up the chords and notes in progressive patterns, by keeping a keen eye on the order of the notes. All the phrasing and placement is done on purpose to ensure cohesion. But music can do something else. Instead of telling a story, music can also paint a picture. One video game franchise that has thrived on mastering the latter is Nintendo's very popular Donkey Kong Country. Originally introduced in the age of wood-paneled arcade cabinets, Nintendo's signature primate was conceived by a little-known Nintendo employee at the time who was just getting his start at video game programming, Shigeru Miyamoto. Donkey Kong was released in 1981 and was a huge success for the company. It earned more than $180 million by late June 1982. Nintendo then moved very quickly to capitalize on this success, and Miyamoto worked to release two more games, Donkey Kong Jr. and Donkey Kong 3, in 1982 and 83 respectively. These games were relatively well received, but not long after, the video game market went into a tailspin, suffering what is now known as the video game crash of 1983. At the time, the mass influx of low quality games and the sheer volume of consoles and competitors led to a perfect storm. There were too many choices and most of them were terrible. Companies like Atari, who were dominating the gaming scene just years before, were now financially reeling. Eventually, others were able to adjust, such as Nintendo, who cleverly marketed their 8-bit Famicom as an entertainment system and not a console in North America. They helped to bring the video game industry back from the grave. But it wasn't dead, it was almost, you know what I mean. Now, Nintendo realized that Atari's failure to properly vet their third-party developers resulted in the market saturation and capitulation of quality that almost wiped out the entire industry. From then on, Nintendo would go on to rigorously quality check their games and assured consumers that what they were purchasing was backed by the quote, Nintendo seal of approval, and the rest is history. Or is it? As Nintendo would go on to release blockbuster hit after blockbuster hit from 1986's classic The Legend of Zelda to the genre establishing Metroid, a certain grinning gorilla found himself on the sidelines. Nintendo likely wanted to move on to greener and newer pastures, but they kept the Donkey Kong intellectual property hidden away, awaiting the perfect time to unleash the ape on the world's unsuspecting supply of bananas. It was a long time, all the way until 1994, 13 years after the release of the original Donkey Kong arcade game, that Nintendo bestowed one of their most treasured IPs to a relatively little known UK game developer known as Rare. Rare had previously worked on Nintendo hardware before. In fact, they had created the cult hit Battletoads for the NES, a game well known for its brutal difficulty, riveting music, and grotesque anthropomorphic toad protagonists. Nintendo had been blown away by a tech demo Rare had put together using cutting-edge technology at the time that had previously been used to make dinosaurs come alive in 1993's Jurassic Park, the masterpiece by Steven Spielberg. 
Love that movie. Love that man. Love John Williams. Big fans. Big fans. Now their SGI or Silicon Graphics Inc. demo of two boxers impressed Nintendo so much that they decided to greenlight their take on the next adventure for Donkey Kong. A game that was to be released on Nintendo's current generation hardware, the Super Nintendo. I'm mentioning SGI because it's important that we contextualize the technology that was available to the video game industry at the time. 3D technology was very new and CGI was in its infancy. When Rare's Donkey Kong Country released in 94 with a computer generated Donkey Kong front and center, Toy Story, the first motion picture film to be entirely computer generated, was still a full 12 months away from theatrical release. Rare's final product was a commercial and critical success, as Donkey Kong Country sold nearly 500,000 copies just a month after launch. Critics were amazed that Rare had been able to squeeze so much graphical capability out of the now aging SNES system, and it wasn't just the graphics that dazzled. Rare had tapped former collaborator David Weiss, who they had previously worked with on Battletoads, to head the score for Donkey Kong Country as well, and Weiss delivered a masterclass in video game ambient music. Rare would go on to release two sequels to Donkey Kong Country, Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy Kong's Quest, and Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie Kong's Double Trouble, perfectly mirroring the sequels that Nintendo ordered to follow the original Donkey Kong's success in the early 80s. It's the first of these three popular 16-bit platformers that steals the limelight with its incredible soundtrack. But first, just what is ambient music? Why does it impact the feel and tone of a game or level so much? And how the hell was David Weiss able to get so much sound out of a tiny little box? I'm gonna go ahead and give 8-Bit Music Theory another shout out here. You guys should totally check out their episode on Donkey Kong and ambient sounding music. On that episode, the host mentions that music through harmonies can tell a story through chord progressions and paint a picture as well. By utilizing a wide array of music techniques like smooth voice leading and chord extensions, terms that are way beyond the scope of our humble show, David Weiss was able to masterfully craft a massively influential body of music, and all of this while dealing with extreme hardware limitations. As David Weiss would go on to mention in an insightful video interview with Game Informer, the SNES allowed for more wide-ranging sounds than the NES did, but it was still severely handicapped by a lack of memory capacity. Now, in the words of Weiss himself, Coming from the NES, which basically sounded like a glorified doorbell, it was nice to be given samples to work with, and it was like being left off the leash. I had all these different ideas that I was trying to get as much in there as possible, with the small amount of space that I had to work with. You can't just put any big synth sounds in there because you just don't have the memory. So it was like taking those bits and putting it back in a different order to see what we could come up with. Weiss's ingenuity and resourcefulness is felt throughout Donkey Kong Country's soundtrack. Those bits that Wise was able to rearrange and stitch together ended up providing the big sound Nintendo was looking for. Whether Donkey Kong is swinging from treetops, dashing through metal rails, or on a runaway minecart, or whether he was swimming his way underwater, Wise's score never missed a beat and it never failed to set the scene musically. The greatness that is the Donkey Kong Country soundtrack starts right off the bat, right when players boot up the game and stare at that main menu. A sunny and cheery tune, whimsical and full of jubilation, wafts from the screen like a breath of fresh air. But this doesn't last long as the song transitions into a solid rock groove. Here, we are introduced to some of David Weiss's prime tools in crafting Donkey Kong Country's unique and revolutionary sound. A series of synth-like bleeps and bloops, coupled with an impressive range of percussion-like sounds. The SNES is barely capable of it, 
but Wise is able to mirror instrumentations in mind-boggling ways. In the main menu theme alone, we have an impressive sounding drum set bundle with included hi-hats, bass drum, and a surprisingly good snare. Wise is able to utilize his arsenal of synth-like sounds to emulate popular instruments such as electric guitars and keys, and the result is a soundtrack that is quite literally ahead of its time and technological limits. Simeon Segway is a track that plays during the game's overworld, when the players are in between the game's challenging levels. Here, we see further proof of David Wise's witchcraft. The SNES was hardly built to be a piano machine. Don't let the NES's miracle piano teaching system fool you. Just look at the disastrous port of Doom and see how well they were able to emulate the original's iconic rock metal soundtrack. Yet, Weiss wasn't deterred and was able to get convincingly accurate keys in there and it goes a long way to adding a very unique feel for the instrumentation that wasn't just rare at the time on current gen hardware, it was unheard of. We also begin to see more of Wise's core influences when designing the Donkey Kong Country soundtrack. Jazzy pianos, funky drumming, and a wide range of auxiliary percussion combine to make this a very funk-centric and rock-driven score, heavy on synthesizers and ambient sounds. It is simply awesome. In that same Game Informer interview that I previously plugged in, Wise was asked about specific artists and influences that he had in mind when creating Donkey Kong Country Sound. Wise would go on to name check prominent European synth artists of the time, such as Academy Award winner Vangelis, who made the soundtrack to Blade Runner by the way, I love that movie, as well as Gary Newman and Jean-Michel Jarre. Wise also goes on to say that trying to recreate and fit as much as he possibly could into the Super Nintendo was a driving force in a lot of the game's compositions. Then. When Wise is asked about the more nature-like sounds that resonate so heavily in his score, he gives an incredibly insightful answer into his percussive philosophy. Quote, I've always been drawn to African and Latin American percussion. Things like bongos, congas, shakers, that kind of stuff. And I just find it a bit more interesting than having a drum kit. And I think it's nice to have a great drum kit, but it's great to enhance it with percussion. I used to work at a music shop before I worked for Rare, and we'd have these early drum machines. It was a 707 and a 727 for percussion. And the 707 sounded great, which was the drum kit, and the percussion sounded disappointing. But when you played them together, it was absolutely awesome. So from early on, I've had this perspective. DK Island Swing is the predominant tune players are greeted by in Donkey Kong Country's early jungle-themed levels. As players battle their way through the stage's anthropomorphic enemies, such as the croc-like critters, and then you have the claptraps, and the rat-like naughties, and the wasp-like zingers, this music follows every which way the characters go. The song starts in a style reminiscent of 1930s big band hit Sing Sing Sing, with a deep-pitched floor tom-like introduction. Then, slowly but surely, additional percussion joins in to add to the natural jungle-like sound. Here, we can really appreciate the aforementioned Latin and African percussive influences Wise was elaborating on with Game Informer. As the tune progresses, we hear more and more of what sounds to be a big band hit, with the hi-hat dropping into a jazzy swing pattern that starts off closed and ends on a sizzle, mirroring the closing and opening of the hi-hat in traditional jazz music.
a drum break and synth interlude that mimics a woodwind instrument then marks the song's shift into a much more ambient driven piece with the drum set fading and being replaced by another floor tom beat in the background as intermingling synth sounds encircle the percussion like vines wrapped around a dense forest canopy. DK Island Swing evolves a few times through its final runtime, the result of Wise's many initial ideas when beginning a project and his desire to pack just as many in. In the Game Informer interview, Wise walks us through his process on coming up with a track for a level on Donkey Kong Country. He'd observe and play through a level first to get a feel for the overall rhythm and pacing of it. Then he would get to work on his keyboard, bashing out ideas. He comments that, for the original Donkey Kong Island Jungle theme, he had about three ideas and he decided to just put all of them in, resulting in the multifaceted feel of the track. It's not all jungles and jollies, however. Sometimes the hunt for potassium takes our lovable primates to submerged cave systems and a heaping helping of claustrophobia. For this track, Wise went the minimalist route, opting for a less is more approach. There isn't a lot to hear in this track, which just helps to keep the focus on the player's traversal through treacherous caves. Instead, we have the constant dripping of water from what must be stalactites on the cave ceiling and the rolling of marimba-ish percussion. Cave Dweller Concert is a perfect example of Donkey Kong Country's use of ambient sound effects to solidify a level's theme. As the track progresses, more and more sounds come crashing through, like pillars of sound being strung together by some unseen puppet master. The track does a wonderful job of encasing you in an eerie dread as all the colliding sound effects sink you deep beneath the earth's surface. But there are still lighter and more playful instrumental hints and elements that, like ropes to the surface, remind you that you won't be here forever. Inarguably the best track in Donkey Kong Country's entire soundtrack, and maybe one of the better tracks of the 16-bit era, Aquatic Ambiance, is just that. A dance of harmonizing synths, some deeper, some lighter, as they ebb and flow throughout the track, not unlike the ebb and flow of the ocean's countless waves. In the song's first phase, the alternating synths fade and hover from the audio background into the foreground and then back again. This repeats until the synths begin to settle down into a rhythm accompanied by auxiliary percussion in the form of a shaker. The constant shake of the shaker bubbles to the top, like bubbles whipped up from our sunken simians. This is Wise's favorite track from the game, and it's mine as well. A big technological feat mixing in a robust bass and imitating what appears to be a saxophone. Wise has played this song with his live band on many occasions, and if you can find a video of it on YouTube, you absolutely should give it a listen. It's great to hear the song the way the artist originally intended, without the limitations of the Super Nintendo and with an actual saxophone. 8-Bit Music Theory has a great bit on aquatic ambience, where they elaborate on Wise's various techniques to create great ambient music, such as the repetition of chords into quote, meta chords, the aforementioned smooth voice leading, as well as the avoidance of using chords that seem to create too much of an expectation or seem to require to resolve later down the measure. Again, this is getting a bit too technical for the scope of our show, so if you want to dive deeper into the nuts and bolts of these compositional devices, you've got to check out 8-Bit Music Theory's video on Donkey Kong Country. 
as Donkey Kong and his red-capped protege Diddy run the gauntlet all the way through the game's finale, Wise's soundtrack matches them stride for stride amidst rapidly evolving hijinks. Some of the most intense levels in the Donkey Kong series involve manic minecart sequences where the player has to make tricky jumps with pinpoint precision. The accompanying track, Minecart Madness, captures the frantic pace of these very well, with dueling synth chords harmonizing as a snare kicks up dust in the background and Wise's sound waves mimic a rousing horn line. Wise flirts with many genres in the soundtrack's 45-minute runtime, from relaxing island music with matching percussion akin to steel drums in tracks like Cranky's Theme, to more jazzy-sounding tracks like the treetop rock riddled with rolling marimbas. Yet, the music remains grounded in the ambient sounds and tones that Wise litters throughout the score to make it come alive. For all the natural sounds in Donkey Kong Country's soundtrack, Wise wasn't phased at all with implementing electronic sounds to go along with the game's more artificial feeling levels, such as the late game Fear Factory, a sprawling hub of machinery complete with levitating steel platforms that the Kongs need to supply with constant fuel from nearby barrels elongated synth progressions and a triple hi-hat feel mixed in with a ridiculously catchy snare make this an amazingly catchy tune, resembling an 80s pop hit. All the while, lighter percussion and a hovering synth melody merge to create a cool sounding tune perfectly in line with much of the popular music at the time. It's songs like this that really make us want to travel to the United Kingdom and get a live concert from the man himself. Another one of my favorite tracks, and certainly another standout from the soundtrack, Gangplank Galleon, starts out as a cheery sea shanty before devolving into something much funkier. The merry band is replaced by a throttling rock ensemble deploying some serious metal. As a drummer of 10 years, I can personally attest to the quality of these drum grooves. Hint, they melt my fucking face off. Listening back to this song, Wise commented to Game Informer that the first thought that comes to mind upon re-listening is Iron Maiden. Further proof of the variety of influences that Wise was incorporating back in 1994 on a stunningly small 16-bit cartridge. The track is also an appropriate backdrop for the Kong's confrontation with the game's final boss, Reptilian Royalty King K. Rule. Without a doubt, one of the best final boss themes in gaming period, and that is not just the hype talking. I can't think of a better audio treat for patient players whom have endured through the game's punishing levels. I know we keep going back to it, but this Game Informer interview with Wise is a treasure trove of insight into the man's mind. In it, Wise outlines the general process for creating a Donkey Kong Country track on the Super Nintendo, and he spared few technicalities. Wise would utilize a particular synth called the Chord Wave Station, capable of producing very small waveforms that could actually fit inside of the Super Nintendo. Neat! We definitely want one. Next, he would look for the appropriate 64k bit drum samples that had to be highly optimized, again in order to accommodate for the Super Nintendo's limits. After Wise had a more concrete idea for the track and wanted to commence his arrangement, he would have to work with 8 monophonic channels, meaning that only one note could be played at a time. Wise would then have to go through the laborious process of assembling the various notes together piecemeal in order to achieve the final product. Altogether, the process was quote, very involved, as Wise puts it, and he would certainly not do it again today with better and more optimal tools around. 
Yet, it was this struggle against the limits of what technology was capable of at the time that pushed Wise to complete Donkey Kong Country's soundtrack as well as work on the soundtracks to the follow-up sequels. The outsized footprints he has left on the industry are a testament to how well he was able to meet this challenge. His music is so central to the identity of the Donkey Kong Country series that years after he left Rare, he was tapped by Retro Studios to score the soundtrack to 2014's Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. A prolific composer, songwriter, and musician, David Wise's work and influence will resonate in the industry for decades to come. If you haven't already, you have to check him out. As for the Donkey Kong Country soundtrack, it's a shining example of what can happen when big ideas are faced with small boxes. There must have been a great degree of pressure on the employees of Rare at the time to make the next big Donkey Kong game a smashing success, all the while deploying new and experimental technology and asking David Wise to fit a symphony into a sock drawer. But beneath such great pressure, occasionally we see the undeniable glimmer of diamonds. And Donkey Kong Country, from its grooves to its gameplay to its graphics, shimmers bright enough to blind. And that wraps up another episode of OSTs and Heartbreak, Audio Quest. I hope you guys had a blast as we navigated the jungles with Donkey Kong and Diddy and discovered some great music alongside David Wise. Just kidding, he wasn't here. Do you think he knows us? Do you think he knows about our show? He should totally check this out. David, if you're listening, we love you. Too much? Thank you guys for listening to another episode of OSTs and Heartbreak. For next week's episode, I don't know, fries? I'll have to come up with something. Maybe Final Fantasy VII? Maybe Persona 5? I don't know. Let me know what you'd like to hear. If you guys have any suggestions for a potential episode, please reach out to us through email, Instagram, Carrier Pigeon. Hit us up at Lisa, tell them. She's going to tell you guys in a second. OSTs and Heartbreak and Audio Quest is research, written, and hosted by Raul Hernandez. It's produced, edited, and mixed by Lisa Love. Our theme music is the Zelda and Chill remix for Song of Storms by Mikkel. The songs that you heard were included for the purpose of reviewing music for this game. You can find more information and links to all of the relevant sources in the show notes. If you liked what you heard, please consider leaving a rating and a review. It's the best way to keep our quest going. We'll be posting new episodes every other Monday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Let us know what you thought. You can find us on Instagram at OSTs and Heartbreak or send us an email at OSTs and Heartbreak at gmail.com. Take care. Lock your doors. Hide your kids. Hide your wife. OSTs and Heartbreak. Don't look outside. There's gotta be something there that you can use. Why you hold it? Do you like it or not? I don't like it. Sucks. It's a suck? Are you done? It's the best episode yet.